video is brought to you by Chariotone and the Gargoyle Tube Amplifier Head. Combining the best features of British and American amp designs, the newest member of the Hot Rod at Plexi cramps 50 years of iconic rock and metal tones into a single channel platform while costing only a fraction of the competition. From classic tube breakup to face melting high gain, this 50 watt beast delivers the goods without skimping on the bells and whistles. Preamp toggle switches, effects loop, line out, it's all here. Well, except for this fabulous stainless steel finish. That will cost you extra. Secure your gargoyle today at the link below. Hey guys, Ryan here at Plexide Studios. Welcome to what just might be the single most nerdy piece of content on this channel. Hopefully we'll surpass it someday, but it's gonna be a pretty high bar. I'm excited to bring this one to you though, because although it's gonna be you know full of analysis, there's gonna be some charts, there's gonna be some technical lingo, this is gonna be really applicable to anyone, regardless of their guitar playing situation, whether you're an all analog guy and play through tube or solid state heads, or you have a digital amp modeler of choice, or your entire guitar production um, experience lies on Mac or PC using VST plugins, you'll be able to take the data in this video and apply it to your use case and hopefully save hundreds, if not a thousand or so dollars on pedals in the process, because we're going to be revealing some secrets some methodologies that I don't think guitar pedal companies really want anyone to know about. That came off more BuzzFeed clickbait than I intended to, but it's the truth in this case. Um, as the old adage goes, there's more than one way to skin a cat, but in this instance, I think you can count those ways on about one hand when it comes to guitar boost and overdrive pedals, because that's what we're talking about today. So for a bit of an overview, as you probably already know, most guitarists that flirt with high gain guitar tones start their signal chain with something that looks like one of these. You can either have kind of your traditional three control layout or even a one knob operation. And there's a few things that you might do with these pedals. The first of which is at a level boost. And that's what this does as well, where you'll throw six, 10, maybe even up to 20 decibels or beyond of clean boost to your signal, just making the raw guitar signal louder to saturate the front end of an amplifier. And that's just to you know completely slam the preamp and put it into full blown high gain saturation. The next thing you might do with a pedal that looks like this at least, is add a little bit of drive boost. Most of the time, high gain guitarists keep this at a minimum or very low for some natural compression, but on amps that may need a little bit more push, you can dial this up to add distortion in the form of asymmetrical clipping diodes, like on this pedal, Tube Screamers use symmetrical clipping diodes. You got MOSFETs, germanium, LEDs, all kinds of op amps that you might find on different pedals. But this does some interesting things that we'll talk about, although we won't be strictly measuring the distortion quality. The main thing most people are focused with though, is this tone control. And what this does is really shape the pre-EQ of your guitar. And in my opinion, with all other variables equal, the pre-EQ of your guitar going into a preamp just might be the single most important thing that can make or break your overall guitar sound because you can have a, a great platform. You can have the, you know, a classic 2203 and perfect, you know, cabinet with green backs or have the, the dual rectifier V30 combo. And if you don't have this right, it can still sound like crap. Fortunately, these kind of pedals give you sort of a, a dummy proof method where it's just like, yeah, find your sweet spot and, and call it a day. But we're going to be talking about exactly what this does what pedals like this do, how it differs from other pedals on the market. And we'll be taking a look at some other classic examples as well and see just what you want to do to your guitar signal chain to make it sound a certain way. Our collection of pedals for this video includes gems both old and new with a couple of revisions of Tube Screamers like the OD820 as well as the classic TS808. We have a few contestants from Boss with the SD1, the GE7 EQ pedal, and even the legendary HM2 Heavy Metal. I'm really pumped to talk about that one. TC Electronics sees some action with its legendary discontinued integrated preamp as well as its spiritual successor of sorts with the TC Spark Clean Boost. We even have some contemporary contestants today, including the Fortin Grind and Fortin 33 Sculpted Clean Boost, and even the Horizon Devices Nano Attack. Before we get to the meat of the video though, I have to give a huge thank you to a couple people who helped make this video possible. First of all, to my Australian brother from another mother, Leon Todd, he provided the exhaustive data on his Nano Attack sample, so huge thank you for that. And then to Alex Vonster, Wonster went, uh, I don't know, I'm absolutely terrible pronouncing anything with umlauts in it, but 
enormous thank you. Uh, he did probably a majority of the work that you'll see in this video. He provided the data on the HM2, his own tube screamer models. He helped validate my own SD1 stuff with his. Uh, he uh, helped validate the Fort and Grind. Uh, he provided his own integrated preamp. There's something I'm probably forgetting, but uh, yeah, half of the stuff, if not more, will be coming from him in this video. So thank you for contributing to the community. And uh, this video couldn't be possible without those guys helping me out. So then let's take a look at some of these frequency plots that we've gathered for this video to see just exactly what the pedals are doing within their circuitry. And remember, if you're going to replicate these findings, whether you're using an EQ pedal or you're using an EQ plugin in your audio workstation program or an EQ block in your favorite amp modeler, remember this goes before the amplifier to get the effects we're talking about. Big difference between pre and post EQ. And this is obviously in decibels per frequency to show the level, uh, relative level that is, of each frequency. So I'm gonna be using terms like peak or band pass, high pass, low pass, high cut, low cut, shelves. Um, so if you need to brush up on any of that terminology, I'll try to find a good resource and, and link you to that. But otherwise, should be self-explanatory. Just copy what you see and uh, you'll get a, a pretty respectable sound out of it. So let's start with this classic Tube Screamer versus SD1 comparison that Alex provided us with. And this was at the pedal settings you see here with the typical, I would call it the seven string guitar boost, level max, drive at zero, and tone at max. And as you can see, they kind of do a similar thing, except the SD1 cuts off just a little bit more low end at any particular frequency, let's say at 300 hertz. It's only about a decibel lower, but it continues to widen the gap down to even as far as like a four decibel gap at around 40 hertz. So the SD1 is gonna clean up more of the low end, which is why I like it for extended range guitars better. At the same time, this particular revision, the 808 keeps quite a bit more high end frequency content. It has a higher center frequency and the overall filter has less aggressive slope, meaning it's less focused. So comparatively, the SD1 is gonna be uh, more quacky, more center focused, which can be good for certain tones, but for a lot of six string work, especially in standard tuning, that's why I often dial back the tone control and a lot of people do the same. Moving the tone to minimum on these pedals though, we see an interesting thing where that center frequency moved from you know, a little over a thousand hertz to now in the five to 600 hertz region, which is why I find these pedals to play better with single coils when you're below noon or even a less aggressive humbucker that simply doesn't need that much high end frequency content. The same thing applies to the filter though. It is less aggressive on the 808 and uh, you get a more focused attack on the SD1. So for this setting, I personally prefer the sound of most tube screamers, but you can kind of see that this tone control isn't really changing the shape of the filter. It's still kind of a band pass or a peaking in the middle with high and low cuts. It's really just moving it, uh, which is one of the oldest tricks in the book when it comes to this kind of filter. So as you might expect, as you move towards the center of the tone knob, the center frequency of the filter is kind of interpolated between the min and max, where we see about 800, 700 to 800 as our center. Of course, the exact position depends on the pedal, depends on the taper of the potentiometer, which is why it ended up being about four on the SD1 and closer to dead middle on the OD808 on Alex's at least. And it's gonna change pedal to pedal because of tolerances and all that. Um, this one's interesting because the SD1 actually manages to keep more high end at this particular setting. And uh, there's really no rhyme or reason other than it's just the way the circuit was designed. So in a nutshell, any pedal that's based on the Tube Screamer topography like this one, if it has a tone control and a single drive level, it's doing this. It's moving between a couple different center frequencies with a big peaking filter. That's about the only trick they have. And it's a good trick because you put this kind of filter in front of a high gain amplifier, it trims off some of the fat and the bass frequencies where it makes the guitar more articulate. You still get plenty of, you know, post EQ bass, so it doesn't, you know, sound flat or anything, um, but it also shaves off some of the scratchy high end, so it kind of tames the pick attack and some of these unwanted frequencies that don't play nice with high gain amps, and you put that through a 5150 or a dual rectifier and it's a classic sound. So here's kind of my take on those. I'll let you listen to the flat signal and then I'll reamp it with a clean EQ curve with kind of my take on, on both the 808 and SD1 sounds. <laughs>
Russ also sent over some data on his OD820, and compared to the 808, it's a very similar pedal. As you'll see though, some of these parameters do change when tone is changed, so it does have a different response at minimum. The max tone is very close, minus some of the low end frequency content, as well as the tone at noon. Uh, but what you will see is this is at gain at two on the H20. So if we move over to the full analysis on the H20, you'll see how those interact. As I mentioned earlier, we're not gonna be discussing the exact character of any of the distortion that might be within these effects pedals. We need an oscilloscope and a few other tools that I simply don't have to talk about those in detail. But what you'll see here is the drive controls in these pedals don't just add dirt, they actually affect the output frequency. So when you keep drive at minimum, you get a curve that looks like that, the one we just talked about. But as you max out tone, at least on the OD820 and presumably most of these kind of clipping diode pedals, you actually get a much flatter response, which is extremely interesting. And that's why I know Mark Tremonti is a proponent of this setup. If you max drive, max level, and actually have your tone closer to minimum, you get a response that's closer to a clean boost, just like a level boost with some added dirt and compression. So the drive control actually does kind of add some of its own EQ influence because there's non-linearities when you, you know, throw clipping diodes in. It's not just like, okay, we're gonna add some dirt. It doesn't quite work that way. And you can see that as we go through the entire tone spectrum. I only have one example of this to show today, so I can't say any of this with, you know, broad certainty but it's almost like the more you turn up the drive, the less it cares about where the tone is. It just kind of defaults to being flatter. Obviously it, it does react differently based on the tone position, but it's almost like it just goes to its center frequency. Um, and I'd, I'd be really interested to know why that is. If you're a pedal designer, do let me know. Uh, but as you can see with you know gain at noon, in this case, it still does react as you would expect when turning up the tone, but the filter itself is quite different. So if you're using one of these pedals and you you know just never touch the drive, I would encourage, play around with it a little bit, um, balance out the gain on your amplifier and see what happens. Speaking of two Screamer clones, let's talk about the Horizon Devices Nano Attack. Now, some people don't know this, but the Nano Attack is actually the same circuit as their first pedal, the Horizon Devices Precision Drive. The only thing it's missing is the noise suppressor and the drive functionality. But as I talked about earlier, a lot of people don't even turn the drive up on their pedals anyway. So if you're using it as a clean boost, just get the nano attack, pretty simple. Um, but it looks like a one pedal operation, but it's not. It actually has two internal trim pots for bright and level, just like the full-fledged pedal does. And all of these are built by MXR. So as you might imagine, this is you know not completely revolutionary technology. It's doing a lot of the same stuff as those Tube Screamer and SD1 examples. So the first thing it does is the attack switch. And this has a six position rotary switch that changes basically that center position of the peaking filter again. Like I said, only so many ways to skin a cat when it comes to boost pedals for guitar. Um, the first two don't really look like they, they do that much different from our analysis. Um, the way that Leon and I did this was only through like 60 point EQ analysis, which is far beyond anything you'll be able to replicate with graphic EQ. That's why I didn't really care, um, but I uh, didn't have an oscilloscope to show you know the point by point differences. So some of these interpolations aren't gonna be perfect, um, but mainly the filters don't change all that dramatically. When you go to three, position three, however, it does kind of center itself around that more aggressive above 1000, below 2000 Hertz region, as you would see on an SD1. The low frequency content becomes a little flatter as well, though certainly still aggressive enough for, you know, kind of down tuned six strings. Positions four, five, and six though approach that extended range guitar territory where the kind of top end of the frequency spectrum is left mostly untouched, a little bit of roll off where it doesn't even really matter. Uh, but you're taming the bass side to kind of give definition to low tuned strings. Of course, this is all at the bright position at noon, and that does change as you move it closer to zero or 10. So at zero, it is a flatter looking filter, um, and the frequency, center frequency itself does move back. And then at 10, it gets extremely top heavy, and uh, I'd imagine on most six strings, this sounds extremely quacky and uh, not good at all. According to Leon's video, and I'm inclined to agree with him, he preferred positions one and two on like single coil strats. I liked position two a lot. 
He liked position three with the uh, six string down tune six string stuff. And he wagers that the later positions are better for seven and eight string guitars. And based on these frequency response graphs, I'm inclined to agree. Here's a comparison of the same attack position with different bright levels. So you can imagine they're kind of going to be interpolated between each other as you move them linearly. Um, and they kind of do what you would expect, except it, it gets really aggressive really quickly. So if you have a really mellow set of pickups, I'd imagine turning up that bright switch for seven or eight string guitar is going to be very valuable. Based on my time playing around with EQ curves, I definitely preferred this position four territory the most for eight string, and I just dialed in some high frequency to taste. It's basically what you would do with the pedal. It's a set it and forget it type thing, um, and then you walk away and you're done. So this is kind of my take on the Nano Attack sound. <laughs> Now, some of you may be a tad disappointed that all the pedals we've shown so far basically do the same thing, and so I don't really blame you. Um, even the modern Nano Attack is really just a modification of a 40-something-year-old circuit at this point, but there are a couple other things you can do. So you don't necessarily just need one tone control. You can use a bass and treble control. And that's interesting because you can independently control the bass and treble frequencies, although they do interact with each other, especially when you put them in a tone stack known as a Baxendal tone stack. And you'll see this on like older Ampeg, I think even Orange Amps were using them in the older models. And uh, that's a cool thing because you actually don't need a middle control. You just turn down the bass and treble if you want more mids. Uh, so it's kind of a, a hi-fi type of sound that you normally wouldn't see on guitar gear. But it comes in real handy when you throw it in the pre-section. And that's where we get to the legendary TC Electronic integrated preamp. Now this black and red monster from the 80s wasn't explicitly designed as a boost for guitar. I mean, you can't even turn it on or off with a foot switch, but it, it turns out it works really well that way because it has like 20 decibels on tap um, for a level boost. The Baxendal Tone Stack gives you, again, those bass and treble controls that combine in a really cool way, especially for heavy metal guitar. And the guitarists of Meshuga, Friedrich Thordendahl and Martin Hagstrom had that figured out in the 90s, which resulted in the amazing sounds on None, DEI, as well as Chaos Sphere. And I'm pretty sure Friedrich Thordendahl owns like half of the existing integrated preamps in the world. So thanks for that. That's why we'll probably never get my hands on one. Fortunately, Alex has one and we'll get to see the frequency response of that pedal thing. It's not really pedal, is it? Because it doesn't have a, a push button, but whatever. So when set to noon, you get a frequency response that, well, is it's about as flat as you can get. There is a, what appears to be a negative half decibel around the 1500 hertz region that will come down to pedal tolerances and no one's going to notice that. So we'll call it flat. But when you turn up the treble control, you get an enormous boost to the 9,000, 10,000 hertz region, but the filter is gentle enough that you still end up with about, what is that, five or six decibels at the 2000 hertz region. And this is exactly why a lot of guitarists just leave treble alone on this integrated preamp or even decrease it a little bit because that is complete ice pick territory at that point. Uh, you don't want to be boosting you know, 5,000 hertz and up that much on a raw guitar signal. This does not sound good. Minimizing treble though sees the otherwise gentle peaking filter turn into more of a low shelf. And with it completely bottomed out, it's even eating into frequencies as low as three and 500 hertz. So you'll want to be very careful with that control uh, as you'll murder all of your main guitar sound at that point. It's a similar story with the bass control, though the center frequencies obviously move down into the 50 to 60 hertz region, at least when maxed out. And again, the filter is such that you're still affecting the 500 to 1000 hertz range when it's turned up really high. The cut, we also see um, an aggressive low shelf and the Q factor is such that you actually get a little bit of a bump on certain frequencies. And that can come in real handy um, as you know, maybe that 500 hertz bump when you have it at negative eight in this instance might sound good on certain guitars. 
but you are demolishing the low end, which is a great trick, again, for seven and eight string guitars. If you minimize both treble and bass controls, you end up with a mid hump around 800 hertz. But as you'll notice with the decibel reading, it's actually very quiet at this point because everything's at zero or under. So you'd have to boost this a lot to get any useful application out of it. But this might be a cool cocked wall kind of sound, depending on what you're going for. And likewise, as you turn both bass and treble to its maximum positions, you get kind of this scooped out profile, which again mimics more hi-fi systems. This is kind of what you would expect a, a bass amp with just a bass and treble control to react like. So it's a very different way of going about it, but it's extremely powerful. You just have to realize that, you know, treble at negative two or zero doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's going to sound the whole time because it reacts with the bass control as well. Um, so they can get complicated to dial in, but once you kind of get your feel for it, I really prefer it. Now here's where things get particularly juicy. As I said before, it's a really popular setting to completely ax the bass response. So if you set the pedal to negative 10 on the bass, turn it all the way off, you get a curve that looks like this. And this actually has treble down to about negative four as well. And what this results in is a big cut to bass. It maxes out at about the 900 to 1000 hertz region. It's a gentle slope, and then it comes down to about negative two and a half decibels relatively at the 20,000 hertz mark. This is interesting for several reasons. Number one, this is kind of what Meshuggah and similar bands would have used in their rigs. More notably though, you'll see there's actually a white line following that green curve, and that is the frequency response of none other than the Fortin Grind. And some of you called this when this pedal came out, and uh, you're 100% right, obviously. And I gotta eat my words a little bit because I thought there was no way that the integrated preamp could actually sound like that. I knew it could do the whole bass roll off thing, but I didn't think that was the curve because when I saw the spec sheets, like 100 hertz as the bass response, 10,000 hertz as the treble, it's like, no, that's way too high and low for a guitar application. What I didn't know is that the, the filters looked that way, that the uh, the decibels per octave were so gentle that it affected, you know, several octaves below those ratings. So you can actually make it do that. What you should take away from that is these pedals are integrated preamps with fixed resistors instead of the bass and treble control. So you could find those resistors on this PCB, plug in bass and treble, and you'll pretty much have an integrated preamp at that point. Also interesting is something I actually already went over in a previous pedal head is these two pedals are identical between same PCBs, obviously some different source parts because they were manufactured on different dates. There is one different part on the PCB that I'm not entirely sure isn't just a protection diode, um, but the differences really lie in the component tolerances. And uh, my friend Alex did manage to prove that again to validate my data. They're the same pedals. So with all that data in mind, I would be willing to bet $100 to a $1 bill that the signature blade that has the, what is it, saw cut deep controls, it's just an integrated preamp. It has to be. <laughs> if, it's, if it's using the same bass treble one level and knowing what that is now, then yeah, they're, they're probably just a rebadged integrated preamp circuit. So I'll save my thoughts on that towards the end, but now you know. <laughs> Now let's talk about something a little different with the Boss GE7. As you know, a lot of you at least will know, I am a big proponent of EQ pedals, both in front of amps as well as in the loop. And what I like about them is you can make your own curve. You know, you can take something that kind of looks like the Tube Screamer curve or even now the Fort and Grind curve and tweak it to your guitar. Cause maybe there'll be one where that pedal sounds awesome, but there's another guitar I have that it's too quacky. It rolls off too much bass. And guess what? With this, you can kind of tweak it to your taste. So as you'll see here, it's not perfect. You only have 
so many controls in this instance seven uh, most time you get 10 on you know like an mxr pedal and maybe you won't even get six on smaller pedals but a lot of the times that can be close enough audibly to where it doesn't even matter and i also showed that on a previous pedal head if you'd like to check that out but to satisfy my curiosity i decided to analyze a few of the individual bands on this pedal starting with the base 100 hertz frequency and as you can see this is just a straight up peaking EQ. There's no high pass going on. You'll not, you know, you're not going to be able to completely cut out all of that low end frequency content, even minimized. It only reaches about negative uh, 10 decibels and you still have a lot of that sub bass territory, which actually isn't that big of a deal on uh, most guitars. It actually can sound okay on extended range guitars, I find, but there's really not a whole lot of frequency content there that's audible at that point anyway. For the 1.6K control, which is an extremely important mid control, just like the 800 Hertz, um, we see about another plus 10, minus 10 decibel rating with a Q factor of what I would estimate to be, what is that, eight to nine decibels um, per octave. So it's enough such that it's going to you know, affect the other EQ settings as well. You're going to get some ripple. So um, this one's definitely going to cover a big range of that, you know, critical mid frequency guitar sound. But um, again, you're not going to get an extremely smooth band pass look like you would with a TS-808 or SD-1. For the 6.4K control, we can see kind of a gentle shelf of sorts. There is a bit of a roll off but uh, at that point it doesn't even matter for a raw guitar signal so you can almost think of this as a linear slope and there's an interesting thing where they're getting this plus or minus 15 decibel rating from how the filters affect the rest of the frequency spectrum so when you cut the treble it actually boosts everything else just because how the filters are implemented and you see that with all of these so flat is flat the cut here boosts the other frequencies the peak there cuts the other frequencies and same thing here so that's why dialing in a, a even a perfect copy if you just go point by point it, it's not going to produce the exact same thing but it's certainly better than nothing and i think this hits the right frequencies and it sounds musical for example here are my interpretations of the fortin grind and Ibanez Tube Screamer curves using the GE7. As you can see, it's missing a few of the critical points, like you've got a bit of a dip at the uh, 1000 Hertz region or so on the Screamer setting, and you don't cut off all the low end on my grind setting, but as I showed in previous shootouts, you really are hard pressed to tell the difference if you don't know what you're listening for, especially, um, but even then it, it almost is really insensitive to some of those bass frequencies and especially that little bit of difference. It's more of the overall curve. If you were to draw straight lines between them all, that's kind of what you're actually going for. So for me, this is still an invaluable tool. It may not be absolutely perfect, but man, will this save you some money if uh, you're trying to chase multiple pedal sounds. For our last couple of examples, let's talk about some fun pedals, uh, starting with the Boss HM2. This is, of course, the legendary Swedish death metal chainsaw guitar tone that you either love or hate. And it's definitely recognizable, no doubt about that. If you put it in front of either a clean or even kind of crunchy on the border of overdriven solid state head, this is kind of the sound you get. And uh, a lot of times that was old school valve states from Marshall or older Randall heads. And the reason it's so distinctive is because when you max all those knobs, you get a frequency response that looks basically unlike anything else to this day, except for that little pink Behringer pedal that copies it. Um, this is it. And it's weird. No doubt about that. So you get an absolutely monstrous peak on the uh, right below 1000 hertz. That's looking around 9000 you get about 1500 and other peaks, so it's kind of a Batman look. I saw a lot of people doing this EQ um, in post, actually, for like VST tutorials a long time ago, and I always thought it sounded like crap, and now I know why. <laughs> and then uh, there's a kind of a gentle slope down to 10,000 hertz after that, but it scoops out basically everything at uh, 250, 240 hertz, and then another big mountainous pillar at 90 hertz and then again another gentle slope and um, that's why it sounds the way it does this is completely alien compared to like a traditional tube screamer boost because you use it more as a preamp more than anything um, and that's why you kind of need a i think a, a flat if not mid heavy guitar amp 
to um, you know kind of complement that sound. If you're going to replicate this sound, I would definitely recommend putting some sort of solid state distortion in there, whether you're putting it in front of a real amp or in the VST plugin world, because just using this alone doesn't really sound the way I think it should, and I'll, I'll show you an example of that. Um, but if you do want to just mimic the EQ curve, you can get rather close with the GE7. As you see, it kind of hits the right marks. It just doesn't have the same filter roll off, especially on the bass side, and um, you don't get quite the same interaction in the high since it doesn't hit the perfect um, you know, frequencies. But it's closer than I thought it would be. It's kind of crazy. It's like they designed them in tandem with each other. So this is definitely a fun one to mess around with. I doubt any of you are going to be using it on any contemporary material though. <laughs> Last and, well, honestly, probably least, but uh, it's a fun pedal nonetheless, we have the TC Spark Booster. This is the full-fledged one, not the miniature, which only has an output. This has a bunch of controls, so um, you have not only a bass and treble tone stack to play with, you have output level, you actually have a little bit of gain, which is it's an op-amp type sound to my ears. I'm not exactly sure what they were using here, um, but you also have a kind of switchable EQ profile, so clean is completely flat, and mid and fat kind of add a mid hump depending on which one you choose it changes the center frequency so let's take a look at that real quick as you would expect with everything set at noon level max and gain at minimum the clean setting is rather transparent except you actually get a little bit more low frequency roll off than i was expecting that's okay again this is right in that prime territory where it makes sense for guitar work but if you turn on the mid switch you get a hump around that 800 hertz region that you know is, is obviously paying homage to a uh, tube screamer design similarly fat uh, kind of does the same thing except moves it down to what i would guess is the 500 to 600 hertz range which to me sounds better on single coils or particularly you know really thin amplifiers if you're trying to make it a little bit more squishy and as you might expect, that does interact with the bass and treble controls. But mid's a good starting point for humbuckers, I find. And uh, unless you want an extremely transparent kind of clean boost sound, that's where I usually keep it because it just works. Setting the pedal to the clean setting, however, the treble control kind of does a similar thing to what the integrated preamp does, except with a more useful frequency in my opinion, for most guitar players, not necessarily extended range guitar players, but this kind of works better for most six string applications. The bass control also resembles the integrated preamp that came before it, but this shows some of the struggles I have with this pedal. Uh, again, it's definitely more suited to most normal guitar players when bottomed out, um, but the overall shape of the filter and the frequency it's hitting in that 400 hertz region is not low enough for an extended range guitar player um, as well as the overall output so this makes it more useful for traditional six string player of all kinds and it actually does sound really good for heavy metal applications when you completely bottom out the bass even at the clean setting and especially at the mid setting specifically this is sort of the shapes you should expect for these particular permutations i generally don't run treble maxed out for that reason i don't like the peak being that high um, but as you can see the mid with negative 10 and zero on treble and even treble maxed out actually hits some really nice frequencies so those are the ones that you'll probably want to experiment with the most if you just kind of want to um, cut into your amplifier a little bit and for a complete cluster of data this is what this pedal looks like set to clean with plus and or minus 10 on both bass and treble controls it doesn't do the backsendal mid hump thing as you can see with both set to 10 which is kind of disappointing 
um, or rather mid scoop, and it also doesn't do the mid hump on the um, the opposite setting. It, it does, but not nearly to the extent that you would see on the integrated preamp. So a lot of people have asked me specifically, is this the integrated preamp? Is this like the replacement? Um, replacement, yes. Is it the same thing? Not even close. Um, and so it's a, a valuable tool. It's great for cleans. It's not bad for leads either, and actually really good for rhythm. But uh, no, it's not the same, which made me sad as well. And that, ladies and gentlemen, will bring us to the end of this little analysis exercise. I had a blast, personally. I thought this was super interesting. It was a lot of work. Um, so I can imagine it was a ton of work for Alex. Again, huge thanks to both him and Leon for providing uh, some of the data you see here, a lot of the data you've seen here. Um, and, but for me, this is enlightening because number one, I get to see what some of my favorite stop boxes do under the hood. I get to know how to reapply that to other situations. And also from an engineering point of view, it's funny to me to see how relatively simple all this is. Uh, not to downplay the engineering that went behind putting that into a box, you know, um, making an elegant PCB and um, getting all the component tolerances right and being able to mass manufacture this stuff. That's a whole different ball game. But being able to produce these filters is child's play compared to, you know, even like the frequency response of a speaker cabinet. It's stuff that, you know, you have to do in a, your circuit lab before you're allowed to graduate uh, on breadboards and stuff. That's not complicated, even compared to like a transistor radio. Um, but I think the main learning is it doesn't need to be. Um, the main sound of a guitar pickup has already been mostly tweaked to amplifiers. And there's only so many amplifier designs out there. There's only so many things you can do. So it makes sense that there's only so many ways that people have um, attacked this drive pedal problem. And that brings up two interesting points, I think. The first of which is regarding guitar player equipment. And I guess you kind of have two extremes on the spectrum. And obviously most people are going to fall closer to the center. But on one end, if it's like the guy who's playing the gold top Les Paul with um, hand wound patent applied for pickups through a vintage 1980 tube screamer and a, a JMP stack with pre roller greenbacks. He's like the traditionalist, like don't change a damn thing. I want the, uh, the resistors to have this code date. I want this, that, and the other perfect. This is the sound of guitar. Don't mess with it. And on the other end, you've got guys who are like, no, screw that. I want my Evertunes. I want my Fishman Fluence pickups with different voicings through PCB layers. I want my amp modelers that can profile stuff and do this stuff on the fly. And that's, I guess, kind of how you could view the extremes. Um, and in one way, you've got one camp that says, you know, bass players have had all these innovations. They have all this gear that can do different stuff. But guitar has been stagnant in, in many ways. Not now. Um, but, you know, what people are doing with their gear is really taking stuff that wasn't meant for that. Taking pickups that weren't necessarily meant for heavy metal. Um, you know, pedals, this one's pretty good for it. But, you know, like a vintage Tube Screamer, not really meant for that. But they make it work. And, you know, we need better stuff. We need stuff that's designed and built for that. And I... I agree with that. But as it turns out, a lot of the old stuff was perfect. It was perfectly suited for, for the job. Look at the integrated preamp. It's just knowing how to take those components and use them correctly. I mean, my favorite heavy metal guitar tone is a boosted 1990s dual rectifier. It, it, it was perfect. It's like they made it work before I was born even. Um, and just taking gear that's even older, you know, the, the TC preamps from like the 80s, uh, and then when eight string guitars came around, I still like vintage wound pickups. So it goes back to that point of don't fix what's not broken. And if you think, you know, you're not getting the tone you want or it doesn't exist yet, try out different things. Oftentimes it's there. You just haven't heard of it or people just haven't thought to use it in a certain way. So that's why tube screamers are still used in all kinds of even death metal bands at this point. The second point though is there is a lot of stagnation, obviously. And, um, you know, we got stuff like a million Tube Screamer knockoffs, which all have their different, you know, little tweaks, which is fine if that's what you're into. But yeah, I mean, we've already seen how many examples of just taking that same basic architecture and, and reapplying it in, in a certain way. Um, and, and marketing gets out in front of all that crap with Horizon devices saying, oh, this is, you know, designed for modern guitar players. Not wrong, it does have more features than a single tone knob, but it does the same thing. I can take an EQ pedal and, and dial in pretty much an, an identical sound. Um, especially, you know, someone could view the, the Fort and Grind thing as really just heinous. I mean, um, 
I already had some some mixed feelings about these essentially being the same pedal with a different paint job, but now that's confirmed. This is just a you know a, a reissued uh, circuit from from years past. And one way I got to blame TC. It's like you're letting this happen. Obviously, there's a market for it. People are buying this. Obviously, people are buying um, like I think Proton had a. Uh, preamp, integrated preamp reissue at one point. So why are you not the ones making it? I, I don't get it. Charge as much as they are for it and make more profit. It, it's asinine to me. But this goes to explain why uh, I think it's is it Peppers, Peepers, Pedal. Can't remember. I'll show them here. Um, but they make a 33 and integrated preamp in one pedal with a toggle switch because it makes sense now. They're the same circuit. They're just switching between resistors. So yeah. And on the one hand, it's like, don't mess with things that don't need messing with but at the the same time now you can really see that the differences really come down to marketing when it comes to this whole clean boost arena so with that i say figure something out new audience i'd love to see it and um, take the existing information here and apply it in every way you can so i hope you enjoyed this exhaustive video any questions comments as always please leave them down below if i forgot timestamps again Please yell at me for that, and we will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.